Professor Nussbaum received her master's degree and PhD here at Harvard, and she has taught at Harvard, Brown, and Oxford universities. She is currently the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics, which is en encompasses work in the philosophy department, law school, and divinity school at the University of Chicago. She has written many books on various aspects of ethics, moral philosophy, and political philosophy, including Cultivating Humanity, Sex, Sex and Social Justice, Hiding from Humanity, and Liberty of Conscience. Her work has won her numerous awards, including the Book Award for the North American Society for Social Philosophy for her book Sex and Social Justice, the American Philosophy, Philosophical Society's Henry M. Phillips Prize for Jurisprudence, and over 30 honorary degrees. Professor Nussbaum's newest book, From Disgust to Humanity, explores how an emotion, disgust, has been politicized as an argument for legal discrimination against gay and lesbian citizens. A recent review in the San Francisco Chronicle called Professor Nussbaum a bracing, forceful rhetorician, and the book a cogent and politically char charged case against the unconstitutional legal arguments that have inhibited the privacy, marriage, and full civil rights of gays and lesbians in the United States. And now please join me in welcoming Professor Martha Nussbaum. Hi, well, it, it's really wonderful to see so many people. I hope you, people will come in to give room for other people to come. Um, what I'm going to do now is to give a little bit of a, a sense of the overall idea of the book and then focus on arguments about same-sex marriage. I knew that this was the path I wanted, said a young gay man to sociologist Rich Savin Williams about his early sexual experiences with um, other male teens, and I knew that I was on it. I knew that some people could sort of experience who I was, and I knew that other people would think of it as being pretty disgusting. This book, although concerned with abstract issues of constitutional law, is essentially about the divide that teen saw before him between people who can sort of experience what a gay teenager feels and people who simply think of those desires and ultimately the people themselves as being pretty disgusting. For a long time, our society, like many others, has confronted same-sex orientations and acts with a politics of disgust, as many people react to the uncomfortable presence of lesbians and gay men with a deeper version akin to that which they take to be inspired by bodily waste, slimy insects, and spoiled food, and then cite that very reaction to justify a range of legal restrictions from sodomy laws to bans on same-sex marriage. Partisans of the politics of disgust can barely stand to think about what that gay teenager did with his friends. They say, oh, that stuff makes me want to throw up, and turn away from the reality of gay life as from a contaminant to the body politic. Although this political approach has lost some ground in recent years, it continues to influence the way that many people think. Disgust, so described, seems pretty nasty a fundamental refusal of another person's full humanity. One might therefore think it just obviously a bad basis for lawmaking in a pluralistic society. Disgust, however, has had some highly respectable and influential defenders in the law. In Britain in the 1950s, Lord Patrick Devlin argued that the disgust of an average member of society was a sufficient reason to make a practice illegal even if it was consensual and caused no harm to third parties. He applied his conclusion directly to, and in fact his whole thing was inspired by, the Wolfenden Commission's report, which had urged the decriminalization of same-sex acts, which, of course, he strongly opposed. He argued that British society would decay from within if it did not make law in response to its members' feelings of disgust. More recently, in the US, Leon Cass uh, of the University of Chicago, and until recently the head of President Bush's National Council on Bioethics, argues that repugnance, and he sometimes uses the word repugnance, sometimes the word disgust, uh, has an inherent wisdom. Says Cass, it's a device implanted in our personalities to steer us away from disastrous and destructive choices. Like Devlin, Cass concludes that disgust is a sufficient reason to ban a practice that causes no harm to non-consenting parties. 
Nor, of course, are these positions merely academic. They're in tune with widespread social forces. In recent years, segments of the Christian right openly practice a politics based on disgust, depicting the sexual practices of lesbians, and especially, I think, of gay men, as vile and revolting. They suggest that such practices contaminate American society, producing decay and degeneration. Like Cass and Devlin, they believe that disgust is a reliable guide to lawmaking. Although the influence of such appeals peaked perhaps in the 1980s and 90s and has since been declining, the politics of disgust continues to exercise influence, often in underground and unstated ways. So we need to understand why it's not a good approach to politics and law in a democratic society. The politics of disgust is profoundly at odds with the very idea of a society based on the equality of all citizens in which all have an equal right to the protection of the laws. It says that the mere fact you happen to make me feel strong negative emotions is reason enough for me to treat you as a social outcast, denying you some of your most basic entitlements as a citizen. The US Supreme Court in Romer versus Evans held that legal deference to that sort of animus, as they called it, violates the most basic idea of the equal protection of the laws. It also violates a fundamental paradigm of public rationality. Laws made in response to such animus lack, they say, a rational basis. Despite these legal setbacks in recent years, the politics of disgust is alive and well, as many groups aggressively depict same-sex practices in such a way as to arouse revulsion and then draw on that reaction when campaigning against the legalization of same-sex marriage or non-discrimination laws. Such appeals are often seen as not politically correct today, so other arguments are put forward. However, disgust has not gone away. It has just gone underground. Now, disgust has two opponents today, each, I think, increasingly powerful in social, political, and even legal life respect and sympathy. The idea of equal respect for persons, surely a key concept through the history of the American democracy, combined with a high evaluation of personal liberty, suggests to many citizens that even when they don't think well of someone's intimate personal choices, they should give them space to make them, so long as they don't trample on other people's rights. Such a politics of equal respect and equal liberty has long been our norm in the area of religion where we're used to the idea that we have to learn to live on terms of respect with people whose choices we may not like or we may even think very bad, and to the related idea that such deeply meaningful personal choices require the protection for us all of spheres of personal liberty. The object of respect is the person, not the person's actions, but respecting one's fellow citizens as equals along tradition holds, a tradition about religion, requires seeing them as choosers and seekers who need a wide space of liberty around them, whether they use that liberty the way the majority wants them to or not, so long as they don't trample on the rights of others. Many people, and myself included, see sexual orientation as similar, a characteristic intimately connected with a person's search for a meaningful life, and therefore something whose abridgment or legal restriction can inflict a profound damage to the very idea of equal respect. The gay teenager, remember, uh, depicted by Savin Williams, needs and deserves equal respect and a sphere of liberty equal to that enjoyed by others. Before he's likely to get these things, however, something else has to be present in our world, as his perceptive comment about other people's reactions uh, suggests, namely the capacity to imagine his experience and that of other lesbian and gay citizens. Disgust relies on moral obtuseness. It's possible to see a, another human being as a slimy slug or a piece of trash only if one has never made a serious good faith attempt to see the world through that person's eyes or experience that person's feelings. Humanity does not automatically reveal itself to strangers. No placard hung on the front of a fellow citizen announces that this one is a full-fledged human being and not a piece of trash. Seeing the shape of a human being in front of us, we always have choices to make. Will we impute full equal humanity to that shape or something 
less. Only by imagining how the world could look through that person's eyes does one ever get to the point of seeing the other person as a someone and not a something. Now, now there I may seem to have moved very far from constitutional law, but, but in the book I argue that actually it's of the greatest relevance to constitutional law because a lot of our failings in this area of law have been failings of the imagination. Uh, and the, the move from Bowers versus Hardwick, where the practices of gays and lesbians are depicted as just something completely different from that which straight people are pursuing and can't even imagine what it might be, uh, to Lawrence, where it's just uh, made clear that their purposes are similar to the purposes of people uh, who seek opposite sex partners and that all are human and all uh, require spheres of liberty. So that, that, that movement, I think, is crucially a movement of the imagination. Now, what I do in the book is I start with an investigation of disgust and the politics of disgust and then move through uh, four areas of law. First, the history of sodomy laws and the history of the final collapse of sodomy laws, then the non-discrimination issue, and here looking at the um, Amendment 2 in Colorado and that uh, trial in which actually I was an expert witness, so, so that um, bench trial I talk about a little bit, but then as it moved to the Supreme Court, very different arguments were used, and the, uh, but eventually the, the propaganda based on disgust was soundly repudiated by the Supreme Court. Then, chapter on same-sex marriage, of which a bit uh, shortly, and then a final chapter on public sex, sex clubs, and the whole question of how the public-private distinction, which I think is a very confused and multiple and, and very ambiguous distinction, has messed up our thinking in this area. So I, I'm happy to talk about that in the question period. But now to same-sex marriage, where I think you'll see, ultimately, that the politics of disgust surfaces. So what are, then, the prominent arguments against same-sex marriage? As we examine them, we have to keep two questions firmly in mind. First, does each argument really justify legal restrictions on same-sex marriage, or only some people's attitudes of moral and religious disapproval. We live in a country in which people have a wide range of different religious and secular beliefs, and as I said, we agree in respecting the space within which people pursue those beliefs. We don't, however, agree that those beliefs all by themselves are sufficient grounds for legal regulation. Typically, we understand that some arguments, including some, but not all, moral arguments, are public arguments bearing on the lives of all citizens in a pluralistic society, and others are simply internal religious arguments. Thus, Orthodox Jews abhor the eating of pork, but few, if any, would think that this religiously grounded abhorrence is a reason to make pork illegal for all citizens. The prohibition rests on religious texts and doctrines that not all citizens embrace, and it can't be translated into a public argument that people of all religions can accept. Similarly, in this case, we have to ask whether the arguments against same-sex marriage are expressed or could be expressed in a neutral and shareable language, or only in a sectarian and doctrinal language. If the arguments are moral rather than doctrinal, they begin, they begin better, they look better at first, but we still have to ask whether the moral values involved are compatible with core values of a society dedicated to giving all citizens the equal protection of the laws. Many legal aspects of our history of racial and gender-based discrimination were defended by what seemed to be secular moral arguments, but that did not insulate them from constitutional scrutiny. And then the second thing we have to ask is whether each argument really justifies its conclusion or whether there's reason to see the argument as a rationalization of some deeper sort of anxiety or aversion, the animus, to use the language of Romer. All right, so the first and most common objection to same-sex marriage is that it's immoral and unnatural. Similar arguments were widespread in the debate about interracial marriage. And in both cases, those arguments were typically made in a sectarian and doctrinal way, referring to religious texts. Anti-miscegenation judges, for example, cited the alleged will of God in keeping the races apart. In fact, the Supreme Court of Virginia 
in a case uh, the, the, that ultimately led to the overthrow of those laws, said that Almighty God had placed the races on separate continents and showed that his will was that the races should not mix. Well, so it's difficult to cast arguments like that in a form that could be accepted by citizens whose religion teaches something different. They, uh, th and I think this is true, similarly, of the idea that same-sex marriage is immoral and unnatural. These arguments look like Jewish arguments against the eating of pork. Good reasons for members of some religions not to engage in same-sex marriage, but not sufficient reasons to make it illegal in a pluralistic society. A second objection, and perhaps it's the one most often heard today, insists that the main purpose of state-sponsored marriage is procreation and the rearing of children. Well, protecting an institution that serves those important purposes is a legitimate public interest. And so there is a legitimate public interest in supporting potentially procreative marriages. Does this mean that there's also a public interest in restricting marriage only to those cases where there may be procreation? This is certainly less clear. It, it is not clear that we've ever thought those important purposes best served by restricting marriage in that way. If we ever did think like this, we certainly haven't done anything about it. We've never limited marriage to the fertile or even those of an age to be fertile. People who don't even meet each other, prisoners serving life terms without prospect of parole, have been held to have a fundamental constitutional right to marry, and those opinions explicitly state that they won't ever meet each other, and well, if they should by chance ever be able to consummate the, the marriage, well, that, that would be an additional thing, but it wasn't what their right to marry was based on. So it's very difficult in terms of the state's interest in procreation to explain why the marriage of two heterosexual 70-year-olds should be permitted, and not to mention those life-term prisoners, and the marriage of two men or two women should be forbidden. All the more since so many same-sex couples do have and raise children. As it stands then, the procreation argument looks two-faced, approving in heterosexuals what it refuses to tolerate in same-sex couples. Sometimes this argument is put a little bit differently. Marriage, the objector says, is about the protection of children. And we all know, don't we, that children do best in a home with one mother and one father. So there's a legitimate public interest in supporting an institution that fulfills that purpose. Well, put this way, about the protection of children, this argument cites a legitimate public reason to favor and support heterosexual marriage, though of course it's less clear why it would give a reason to restrict marriage uh, to those sorts of cases. Its main problem, however, is with the facts. Again and again, psychological studies have shown the children do best when they have love and support, and it does appear there's some evidence that two-parent households do better at that job than single-parent households for obvious reasons of economic stress. There's no evidence, however, that opposite-sex couples do better than same-sex couples. There's a widespread feeling that this just can't be right, that living in an immoral atmosphere must be bad for children. But when the welfare of children is defined in a neutral manner, not in a religiously inflected manner, there is, in fact, no difference. A third argument is that by conferring state approval on something that many people believe to be evil, same-sex marriage will force those people to bless or approve of that thing, thus violating their conscience. Now, this argument was actually made by uh, a person whom I deeply respect, uh, law professor Charles Fried from Harvard Law School, in his book, Modern Liberty, which is an excellent book, uh, and it's a book which strongly assails the sodomy laws and defends spheres of liberty around each person. So it's an interesting thing that Fried draws the line at same-sex marriage, and he does it because of this idea of enforced approval. So what precisely is Fried's argument here? Fried is not suggesting that the recognition of same-sex marriage would violate the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, and I think that would be a perfectly impossible position to take, given the precedents. Presumably, then, his position is that the state has a legitimate interest in banning same-sex marriage just on the grounds that it offends many religious believers. Now, this argument contains many difficulties, and, and I have to say that there's um, a, a footnote that raises alarm in me where Freed says that even to think about ending the sodomy laws, we, we need to 
stop ourselves from thinking about the sex acts performed by gays and lesbians. And I think, why do we have to do that? Well, I think um, there, so, so, so the, the, the idea that disgust is in there, in the stew somewhere, is certainly suggested by that footnote. But anyway, um, all right, so first, the argument I think raises an establishment clause problem, because religions in America vary greatly in their attitudes to same-sex marriage. My own denomination, Reform Judaism, has long approved of and practiced same-sex marriage. So does conservative Judaism. And of course, other religions have internal splits, and still others might be strongly opposed. But so there's this great variation, and, and the state, following Freed's argument, would be siding with one group of believers against another. More generally, there are a lot of things that a modern state does that people deeply dislike, often on religious grounds. Public education teaches many things that religious parents abhor, such as the theory of evolution and the equality of women. And of course, the courts have been full of cases involving those. But on the whole, the religious parents have not been able to shoehorn uh, out uh, the, the, uh, that content just because it offends them. Public health regulations license butchers who cut up pigs for human consumption. Jews don't want to be associated with that practice. But nobody believes that Jews have the right to ask that the state end this practice for everyone. The old order Amish don't want their children to attend public school past age 14. Well, the state respects that choice for Amish children and even allows, in the Wisconsin versus Yoder case, that those parents may break a law that applies to everyone else. But, of course, nobody would dream of thinking that the Amish have a right to demand that no children go to school beyond age 14. Part of life in a pluralistic society that values the non-establishment of religion is an attitude of live and let live. Whenever we see a nation that does allow the imposition of some religiously motivated preferences on all citizens, as with some Israeli laws limiting activity on the Sabbath, and as with Indian laws uh, prohibiting the slaughter of cows, we see a country that has a religious establishment, de jure or de facto. We've chosen not to take that route, and I think our choice was a wise one. To the extent that we do uh, choose work days, holidays, and so on, that coincide with the preferences of the majority, we bend over backwards to be sensitive to the difficulties that this may create for minorities and to give them escape hatches from those difficulties. A fourth argument, which again cites a legitimate public purpose, focuses on the difficulties that traditional marriage seems to be facing in our society, pointing to rising divorce rates and evidence that children are being damaged by lack of parental support. People say we need to defend traditional marriage not to undermine it by opening the institution to people who don't share its traditional purposes. Well, we could begin by contesting this characterization of same-sex couples. In large numbers, they do have and raise children. Marriage, for them as for other parents, provides a clear framework of entitlements and responsibilities, as well as security, legitimacy, and social standing for their children. In fact, the states that have legalized same-sex marriage, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and now Iowa, have among the lowest divorce rates in the nation. And the Massachusetts data show that that rate has not been rising uh, over time. We might also pause before granting that an increase in the divorce rate signals social degeneration. Often in the past, women stayed married, enduring neglect and even abuse, because they had no marketable skills and no employment options. But OK, let's stay off that and just concede for the sake of the argument that uh, there is a social problem. What then about the claim that legalizing same-sex marriage would undermine the effort to defend or protect traditional marriage? If American society really wants to defend traditional marriage, as it is certainly entitled to do and probably ought to do, many policies suggest themselves. Family and medical leave, drug and alcohol counseling on demand, generous support in health policies for marital counseling and mental health treatment, strengthening laws against domestic violence and enforcing them better, employment counseling and financial support for those under stress during the present economic crisis, and of course, tighter enforcement of child support laws. Such measures have a clear relationship to the stresses and strains facing traditional marriage. 
the prohibition of same-sex marriage does not. If we were to study heterosexual divorces, we would be unlikely to find even a single case in which the parties felt that the primary factor leading to their divorce was the availability of marriage to same-sex couples. <laughs> divorce is usually an intimate personal matter bearing on the nature of the marital relationship. The objector at this point typically makes one further move. The very recognition of same-sex marriage as on a par with traditional marriage demeans or debases traditional marriage. What's being said, it seems, is something like the, the claim that including in the Hall of Fame baseball players who are known to use steroids cheapens that honor and sullies the achievements of the athletes who are already in the Hall of Fame. So in general, uh, the recognition of a kind of low level or cheating contender for an honor cheapens or sullies that honor. I think that's the kind of argument that people are trying to make when they say these things, that recognition of same-sex marriage defiles traditional marriage and, and so on. So how should we evaluate that argument? Well, first of all, we should challenge it on the facts. Same-sex couples are not like cheating athletes, or at least no more so than heterosexual couples. They want to get married for reasons very similar to those of heterosexuals, to express love or commitment, to gain religious sanctification for their union, to obtain a package of civil benefits, and often to have or, and raise children. Traditional marriage has its share of creeps, and there are no doubt same-sex creeps as well. But the existence of creeps among the heterosexuals has never stopped the state from marrying heterosexuals. Nor do people talk or think that way. I've never heard even one person say that the willingness of the state to marry Britney Spears or O.J. Simpson cheapens or sullies their own heterosexual marriage. But somehow, without knowing anything at all about the character and intentions of the same-sex couple down the street, they do think that their own marriages would be sullied by public recognition of that union. If the proposal were to restrict marriage to worthy people who have passed a character test, it would at least be consistent, though I think very few people would really defend such an intrusive regime. What's clear is that those who make this argument don't fret about the way in which Im immoral or unworthy heterosexuals may sully the institution of marriage or lower its value. And given that they don't worry about that, and given that they don't want to allow marriage for gays and lesbians who have demonstrated their fine character, it's difficult to take this argument at face value. The idea that same-sex unions will defile traditional marriage, I think, can't be understood in the end without moving down to the terrain of disgust and contamination. The only distinction between the class of heterosexuals and the class of gays and lesbians that can possibly explain the difference in people's reaction is that the sex acts of the former do not disgust the majority and the sex acts of the latter do. The thought must be that to associate traditional marriage with the sex acts of same-sex couples is to defile or contaminate it in much the way that eating food served by a Dalit used to be taken by many people in India to contaminate the high caste body. Nothing short of a primitive idea of stigma and taint can explain the widespread feeling that same-sex marriage defiles or contaminates straight marriage. If we're looking for a historical parallel to the anxieties associated with same-sex marriage, we can find it in the history of debates about miscegenation. At the time of Loving versus Virginia, which wasn't until 1967, shockingly late, which overturned the laws against interracial marriage, at that time, 16 states both prohibited and punished marriages across racial lines. Furthermore, Although states were required to honor divorces performed in other states with more lenient divorce regimes than their own, this saw the case of miscegenation was different. That was not the case with interracial marriage. So it's the one parallel to the Defense of Marriage Act, in other words. States that had laws against miscegenation refused to recognize marriages between blacks and whites legally contracted elsewhere, and often even criminalized those marriages. The Supreme Court case that brought about the overturning of the anti-miscegenation laws, Loving versus Virginia, was just such a case. 
Mildred Jeter, African American, and Richard Loving, white, a lovely name for this case, uh, got married in the District of Columbia in 1958. Their marriage was not recognized as legal in their home state of Virginia. When they returned, they were arrested in the middle of the night in their own bedroom with a framed copy of their marriage certificate hanging over their bed. They were then sentenced to one year in prison, but they were told that if they left the state for 25 years, the, the sentence could be waived. So they left the state, and then they began the litigation that led nine years later to the landmark decision. Like same-sex marriages, cross-racial unions were opposed with a variety of arguments, both political and theological. In hindsight, however, we can easily see that disgust was at work. Indeed, it did not hide its hand. The idea of racial purity was proudly proclaimed, for example, in the Racial Integrity Act of 1924 in Virginia. And ideas of taint and dirt and contamination were ubiquitous. If people felt disgusted and contaminated by the very thought that an African American had drunk from the same public drinking fountain, or gone swimming in the same public swimming pool, or used the same toilet, or the same plates and glasses, all widely held Southern views, and I should also say views that my father, who was born in Macon, Georgia, but practiced law through most of his life in Philadelphia, maintained until the very end of his life and kept uh, trying to push my way. Uh, and he really did believe, this fine lawyer, that if an African-American person had drunk from a glass, you could not drink from that glass ever again. You just had to throw that glass away. So you know, the, the grip of these magical views of, about disgust and contamination is, is very deep. So if, you, if that's all true about swimming and drinking and so on, you can see that the very thought of sex and marriage between black and white would have carried a powerful freight of revulsion. The Supreme Court concluded that such ideas of racial stigma and taint were the only ideas that really supported these laws, whatever else people said. Quote, there is patently no legitimate overriding purpose independent of invidious racial discrimination which justifies this classification. We should draw the same conclusion, I think, about the prohibition of same-sex marriage. Irrational ideas of stigma and contamination, the kind of animus the court recognized in Romer, is at least one of the most powerful forces in its support. So thought the Supreme Court of California in October 2008, uh, writing, beyond moral disapprobation, gay persons also face virulent homophobia that rests on nothing more than feelings of revulsion toward gay persons and the intimate sexual conduct with which they are associated. Such visceral prejudice is reflected in the large number of hate crimes that are perpetrated against gay persons. The irrational nature of the prejudice directed at gay persons who are ridiculed, ostracized, despised, demonized, and condemned merely for being who they are is entirely different in kind. Well, then it goes on with a technical legal argument contrasting it with other groups that had been denied suspect class status. So, so we've now seen the prominent arguments against same-sex marriage. They do not, I think, stand up very well. We haven't seen any that would supply government with a compelling state interest, and it seems likely, given Romer, that these arguments motivated by animus fail even the weaker rational basis test. The argument in favor of same-sex marriage is straightforward. If two people want to make a commitment of the marital sort, they should be permitted to do so, and excluding one class of citizens from the benefits and dignity of that commitment demeans them and insults their equal dignity. This, I think, is an exclusion that we can no longer tolerate in a nation dedicated to the ideal of equal justice for all. Yeah, I actually spend more time on the arguments in, in the book, of course. I mean, um, Devlin, I think, uh, I mean, for his whole view of society is solidaristic. Uh, he thinks that society ca cannot marshal the strength to resist, for example, an enemy, an external enemy, unless people have a high degree of solidarity around basic moral convictions. And his only support for that is purely speculative. Uh, he just says, well, 
homosexuals, he says, will be like people who are sunk in drug addiction and they will lack the will to fight. Well, this parallel is, of course, completely weird because the, the, they're, they're no more like drug addicts than any uh, other persons are. Whether certain drug addicts are unable to fight, that's a, an empirical question and one should investigate that. But certainly to just say that because of your sexual practices you're unable to fight, we now know that that's empirically just totally false. So, so that was his uh, argument. Leon Cass has a very different view. I mean, Leon Cass is not a a Burkean conservative like Devlin, he's, I think his idea of disgust is much more, as it were, teleological and theocratic, although he doesn't mention God. He does use words like implanted in us, and I think the idea is that there's a purposive nature to disgust. I think he believes that it was implanted in us by God uh, in order to steer us away from evil, and so if we go against it, um, very likely evil will befall. But see, once again, there's just a complete lack of empirical scrutiny of the actual cases because we, of course, there's so many cases where something that was once disgusting to the majority has been accepted and embraced with no harm to society. The integration of children with disabilities into the public schools is, I think, one of the most salient examples of something that, you know, at one time, most people, oh, yeah, you know, I can't look at these people, they disgust me, and so on. And yet, of course, uh, now uh, in the wake of uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and all the, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, people with a variety of disabilities, both mental and physical, are, um, are in public, in our society. And what's happened is in, in, instead of society falling apart, uh, the disgust has fallen apart. And I, I have a, a colleague who has a very serious physical disability that, that uh, is, is kind of a neurological disability. And he likes to point out that under Illinois law, until quite recently, he would have been unable to appear in public on the grounds that he would discuss people. Well, he's one of our best professors of constitutional law. He's an absolutely wonderful person and a father and a family person. And you know, just uh, so, so all these things are the result of the integration, but the integration had to come first because uh, the, when the people weren't seen, who who knew you know what would what would happen? So uh, I guess that's my prediction, and it's not just my prediction, but I think it's borne out by a lot of empirical evidence about uh, generational differences about gays and lesbians, namely when they're out, when they're seen, when they're known to be your friends, your peers, and so on, that these attitudes of disgust crumble. And there is a very definite uh, generational difference uh, around this, which makes me actually much more optimistic about sexual orientation discrimination than I am about misogyny, because uh, you know it's not not the case really that the desire to subordinate women goes away once you see women, uh, not at all. So, uh, but I think um, so. So you know, in in some ways, I think it's very much like disability that that when the people are out, when they're part of the public space. Uh, then uh, one can't help noticing that there, there's humanity and there's not demons there. So, um, so anyway, that's, that, that, that's what um, I, I think the evidence is, is showing us. Well, yeah, now here I, I d debated for a long time how far deep, how deep I wanted to get into polygamy and incest because, as you well know, those are the scare stories that are used in the slippery slope argument. If we allow same-sex marriage, then we'll be forced down this slope and we'll have to tolerate polygamy and incest. Well, actually, I think the, the this, this or, okay, the framework of the legal argument is typically that the state will have to show a compelling interest to deny because, okay, under the due process and the equal protection clauses, all individuals have a fundamental right to contract a marriage and that right can be trumped only by a compelling state interest. So what is the compelling state interest in the case of gays and lesbians? Well, courts have repeatedly concluded they can't find any. Uh, what would it be in the case of polygamy? Well, um, the polygamy that used to be practiced uh, used to be sex unequal, and it used to be a mode of subordination of women in a way. I mean, although I don't know that at, in the 19th century it was any worse than monogamous marriage in that respect. But, um, it, you know, what I think if, if polygamy that was available only to men were what was under discussion, then one could certainly say we have a compelling state interest in sex equality that trumps that. It would be parallel to, there's a case called Bob Jones versus US where Bob Jones University, which forbade interracial dating, was held to 
uh, so there was, they lost their tax exemption, and it was held that that was a substantial burden to their free exercise of religion, but it was trumped by the compelling interest in racial equality. Now, that has never been said about sex. And the courts don't want to go there because it basically means that the Catholic universities whose presidents are required by statute to be a member of a certain order of priests, ergo male, they would have to lose their tax exemptions. I mean, I honorable exception of Georgetown, which changed its statutes and now has a lay president, but uh, all the others, you know, would be, they would be in big trouble if Bob Jones, if, if race and sex were treated similarly by the courts. Uh, but in any case, let's just suppose the courts really cared about sex equality in the same way that they cared about race. Then I think there would be a compelling state interest in sex equality that could be, uh, could trump that kind of old style polygamy. But now what about what's uh, called in these days polyamory, that is uh, an agreement among a group of people, both male and female, to have, let's say, sexual exclusivity within the group and, and not with others and so on. Well, what would be the compelling state interest that could prohibit that? What I can think about is administrative complexity, because obviously, <laughs> you know, it's hard enough, you know, when you have multiple marriages, right? But if you look at the history of the concept of compelling state interest, they're very resistant to the idea that administrative complexity all by itself supplies a compelling state interest. Um, the one case where they did allow that was in a case where Native American parents did not want to give their child a social security number uh, for religious reasons. And they said, look, we, we just can't run the country if some child doesn't have a social security number. Uh, but I, would this rise to that height? I don't know. I mean, that would, have to, that would be the terrain on which it would have to be uh, fought out. But I don't think there's anything intrinsically heinous about um, polygamy so long as it's uh, consensual and, and sex equal. Now, incest is complex because you've got parent-child incest. Now, that's a case of child abuse, so okay. And I, I think it's fine to have a very um, firm uh, prohibition of any kind of relationship, even allegedly consensual, between um, parents and ch children, maybe even when the children have passed the normal age of consent because it often reflects an underlying pattern of abuse. But an adult brother and sister, the usual interest that's cited is a health interest. And, you know, that just doesn't stand up anymore because we have genetic uh, testing, we have counseling, and we allow people with the Tay-Sachs gene to get married. We just counsel them about children and so on. So I think the public health interest just doesn't work anymore. And uh, our society is very two-faced anyway about brothers and sisters because they, everyone goes and you know, moons over Die Valkyrie and uh, poems of Byron and Shelley and all these very romantic depictions of incest. And then they say, oh, horrible and disgusting when it's in a real life context. So, um, but you know, so I, I think we really ought to think about these things. But saying it in a book where I was trying to persuade the general public, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I did in the end. Uh, I, I wrote it without that, and then I just thought, well, you know, this is me, and this is what I think. And so I added that bit, and then I added the, the whole chapter about public sex and bathhouses, uh, which, again, I think is going to put some people off. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think, it, it, if P, I think the, uh, there the operative distinction is uh, is consent. And I think Mill was on the right track where he said, the right distinction is not the public-private distinction, it's the distinction between the self-regarding, that is what concerns only the interests of the parties who participate and consent, and the other regarding, that which implicates the interests of people who don't consent. And so sex in a sex club or sex by two people who seclude themselves in the woods or something seems to me self-regarding in Mill's sense. And so I think we, we, we should certainly uh, you know, protect it in, in the same way that we protect sex in the home. So anyway, so th those are the ways in which I got uh, ahead of my <laughs> desire to persuade the public. <laughs> well, the question whether to approach this question legislatively or through the courts, I think is very complicated. Now, what's often said is, oh, courts are not democratic, and this is a democratic issue. Now, of course, that's uh, for the reason that you suggest in, in your the phrasing of your question, it doesn't quite uh, make sense because we've decided that the kind of democracy we want to have is one where certain fundamental rights are protected beyond the reach of majority vote. So to, to turn it over to the majority is a little bit odd in that sense. But um, 
so I really think this is an issue that implicates fundamental constitutional rights. It doesn't have any business being voted up or down by a majority. However, in terms of the evolution of, of, of our society, I think it's dangerous to have people who are perceived as elites deciding on something, getting, you know, pitting themselves against majorities. We see with the abortion issue how difficult that has been. And a lot of people believe that if Roe had been decided later or there'd been a more gradual se series of cases while society evolved, it would have been a, a, a better thing. And I think with sodomy, what happened was they really did, they, they waited there, they bided their time, and by the time they decided it, there really was no opposition. And, but if they decided the marriage thing, and that's what I think the boys Olson case splendid though it is, is dangerous because the court is going to, they're going to say no anyway. But I mean, even if they hadn't been inclined to say no and they had said yes, then there would have been a terrible backlash and people would immediately try to strip the court of various powers that it has. Because there have been these court stripping bills that have been introduced to say things like court, Supreme Court can't hear cases connected with the Pledge of Allegiance, for example. And so that kind of thing would start up and then we'd have uh, just a terrible battle about Supreme Court appointments, even more terrible than we now have. So I guess I think that that might be one reason to, you know, to hold off and not have the Supreme Court weigh in. I hope they don't have to. I hope they find, as with the pledge, they found a they found a technical exit strategy. They didn't have to decide the case uh, because they found the plaintiff didn't have standing. And and I hope they can avoid deciding the the Bowie's Olson case because I think it's going to be very bad for the country. Now, state courts are different, and but then each state is different. And so sometimes the court um, has a kind of legitimacy and it's not gonna be countered by the public. California, as we see, the given the ease of the referendum thing, it, it turned out differently and it's been uh, very ugly and, and unpleasant for everyone. So I think each state has to decide what's the best for it. One, the one more thing I'll say on this is we should not assume, even if pe people like majorities, we should not assume that legislatures are the voice of the majority. That's often not the case. They're the voices of lobbying groups and various other things. And in the ca case of Illinois, where in my state, we've been fighting for about 15 years to get civil unions, vast majority of citizens support civil unions and probably marriage too. And not only that, but a vast majority of Catholic citizens support civil unions. However, the Catholic hierarchy does not support it. And for that reason, politicians who are going to have to run for re-election in two years don't want that trouble. They don't want to vote against the bill because they know their constituents support it. But they don't want to vote for it either because they know that if Cardinal George denounces them from the pulpit, that would just get in the way of their re-election campaign. And so they bottle it up in committee year after year after year. It never comes to the floor for a vote. So that is not democracy. I mean, it's not, so, so even if you one liked majorities, that is not it. So in a case like that, uh, I think the poor majority has nowhere to go but the courts. And that's what a lot of concerned politicians in Illinois are thinking. So, so anyway, that's just a, a, a further wrinkle to that issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'm saying is that you don't get to respect unless the imagination is active first, because if the imagination doesn't ascribe human purposes, then you can't get even to the point of respecting somebody. So, I mean, one position might be respect is insufficient uh, and we need sympathy too, but my position is even, as it were, stronger that we can't quite have respect without activating sympathy. And I think that's just true in life generally, that um, you know, the ability to see another human being as a full-fledged equal human being is an imaginative achievement. And it's one that often doesn't happen when you just see these shapes and you think, oh, well, that's an utterly different sort of creature. And we know that subordination of all kinds of uh, racism, um, homophobia, misogyny, and so on, often proceeds by saying, well, this is essentially kind of a different species. It's not, not my, my kind at all. And uh, then the imagination has just not done its work. I, I mean, this is connected to another great um, concern of mine, which is the 
uh, the <laughs> decline of the humanities in public education because I think, you know, that imagination needs to be cultivated and it's increasingly being, you know, being neglected and, and so we, we could well lose uh, ground here if, if we aren't alert to the fact that the arts and the humanities are essential ingredients. And, I mean, if I just wanted to point to one thing that's made pr progress for us on this issue, I might point to will and grace because, you know, that over the years, uh, because it's very funny and well acted uh, and, and then cleverly depicts a range of gay lifestyles, not just one thing, but also depicts people who are pursuing lots of different things, pleasure, sex, but also love, friendship, and so on. Um, it gets people imaginatively involved with gay lives in a way that, um, you know, the pleasure kind of sugarcoats the learning experience. And, and I would say that that's done a great deal for that issue in our country, perhaps not as much as knowing people who in real life are lesbian and gay, but something, you know, because sometimes people are living in places where people aren't out and don't feel they can be out and then they can still see TV. So, um, yeah, so I think the imagination is crucial and the, the ability to connect to someone that you know and care about, you can connect gayness to humanity, is 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 really what we need here. I remember my, my mother was terribly homophobic, like most people of her generation, and then she realized that Rock Hudson, who she always had a crush on, was gay, and, and it just kind of turned her around like that because she had always recognized him as a human being, and she had a crush on him, and um, so all of a sudden she realized a gay person could be human. But and that was at the age of 65 or something. Uh, but but anyway, you know, it's that kind of thing that we need to rely on because otherwise we just um, have something completely um, abstract uh, that isn't filled up with any kind of sense of, 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 of the other as a human. Well, this is, a, of course, a wonderful question and it's like a perpetual, it's a, it's a, it's like a blueprint for humanity's education, isn't it? I mean, it's starting with that problem. How can we ever uh, inhabit the experiences of another? Um, well, of course, how can we ever inhabit our own is an equally uh, difficult question. And, and what, what we know is that very often the two go together and, and, and people who have never been asked to talk to their family about their own feelings and their fears and their weaknesses and their shame have a corresponding difficulty in imagining how their behavior affects others. So, um, yeah, but I mean, so the first thing would be the, you know, the simple one, well, we all have experiences and, and they're sort of similar. But of course, a big part of that education would be to show how different conditions of life and different backgrounds construct different inner worlds. And I think that's why a big part of humanity's education should be to confront works written by people from the different minority positions. And, and of course, those works both invite and to some extent repel understanding. Richard Wright said his whole aim in creating the character of Bigger Thomas was to show that you couldn't understand his point of view and how far you couldn't understand it. So knowing all those things, uh, you know, is what we ought to be doing all the time. And it isn't just about groups. Um, one time I was in India with an activist and, and we were working on a literacy project for little girls and, and, and I said to her, what, what, what would you urge me to say when people ask how I as a Western person could understand the experience of, of these girls in India? And she thought for a while and she said, you know, I have the greatest difficulty understanding my sister. So I think the, you know, what that was saying is there are obstacles in any human relationship. And they're not, I mean, it's not even a question of more or less, it's a question of different. And maybe the obstacle in the case of the sister is about rivalry and envy. The obstacle in the case of me understanding those little girls is just ignorance and lack of uh, experience. And, and of course, power interests or whatever interests one brings to it. Um, but anyway, I think you know what we all have to learn is that there are those obstacles, that they exist in our relation to ourself just as much, and that we uh, we, we really need to um, learn how to talk about the obstacles and how we might possibly get around them. And I think with the with lesbian and gay issues, I I've, I've puzzled about this because I, I, when I teach um, law students, particularly, 
and I had this course called Law and Literature, where one of the things I wanted to talk about was, th was this issue of understanding minority perspectives. And what could they read that would confront them with lesbian and gay perspectives that they would be able to then talk about and that we could have a good class about? That was the question. Now, the difficulty there was, because I have a wide range of students, and we get about 20 students every year from BYU who have extremely homophobic attitudes. And then, of course, there's the whole range of attitudes. If I give them something from contemporary gay fiction, it's going to put them off at very quickly. And the people, a large segment, just will find it disgusting and they won't be able to get past that. If I give them E.M. Forster's Morris, the gay and lesbian students will say, oh, this is terribly sentimental and disgusting, you know. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's very difficult. So I, in the end, I guess Savin Williams's book and things like that, where they're actually interviews with uh, people is what I found uh, the best. But anyway, so, so there are all, all, these, all these problems are great. And you know, that's why we really need to spend a lot of our lives um, studying the humanities because it's only there that we get this kind of refined um, dexterity in negotiating our way through these problems. Ah, did everyone hear the question? Uh, she asked whether tolerant societies in the West have an obligation to promote tolerance in societies that are not so tolerant. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I guess one might contest that characterization because I do think that um, the U.S. has a long history of Puritanism and intolerance that's not paralleled by, by anything in Europe except possibly Britain. I mean, so if you go back, I mean, France got rid of the sodomy laws with, under Napoleon. And, and, and so there's a big, big difference with, uh, and, you know, I mean, I think India has been about neck and neck with the U.S. in combating this issue. Um, maybe, you know, in social respects, there may still be much more, um, discrimination uh, in public space, at least. But the Nas case was, I thought, just so beautifully argued, and it was argued more, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, all the disgust stuff was brought out in that case in, in such, such a powerful way. So I thought it was one of, it was the case that threw out the sodomy laws in India. Um, so, so I think in, in terms of societies around the world, there's great variation. And, and I mean, but, but, but uh, in general, do, does a country have obligation to promote uh, the good in another country? Well, I think that's a very, it's something one should back off from uh, in terms of any intervention. Now, what I do with most of my life is to have this Human Development and Capability Association, which is fostering a certain conception, which of which this would be one part, of course, um, uh, of what a good basis for uh, social justice would be. But I think, you know, get out there in the international arena, argue, persuade, help NGOs that are doing good work on that area and, and uh, make, make networks with, with them. But for the country to do something politically to another country, I, I, I'm really quite wary of that. And I think the most that one could probably with the ones justified in doing, if if it's a country with any degree of legitimacy. Now, of course, some some countries, if there's mere uh, tyranny, then one might have more liberty to help the underdogs in some way. But uh, but I mean, let's assume it's a country such as uh, Pakistan, uh, with which is not a perfect democracy by any means, but it's a country with m some degree of legitimacy. Anyway, I think you know, give money to organizations that are working on issues that you care about. That I think a nation can do, rather than just giving its foreign aid directly to the government, which in the case of corrupt governments would be a stupid way of spending your money anyway. You might well give it to NGOs who are working on education of girls or some other issue that you care about, and, and that happens all the time. Most of the projects that I've worked with on female literacy have been supported by the governments of Sweden, Netherlands, and so on. Um, so I think that's okay. That's not too imperialist, but any kind of direct governmental intervention, either economic sanctions or, or political pressure, I think is, uh, you know, has got to be really watched out for. And um, because one, one, one reason is it's just wrong. I think nations are sovereign and they have a right to choose their own policies. But, um, but another reason is it's often a cover 
for something else, as we well know, with uh, the Iraq War and the way that language of rights was, was used there. That's a really neat question. Um, I, I don't know, but uh, I, I guess I think in all societies of all kinds, not just party politics, democracies, but other kinds of governments, you always find some group that's stigmatized and targeted for disgust. The Jews in medieval Europe, women in so many times and places, right? Uh, now, Walt Whitman thought that somehow or other we could learn to rise above that and that there could be a society that just embraced the body. And I, I think he, well, the disgust with one's bodily fluids needn't have anything wrong with it. I mean, it's only when you start projecting it onto other people or onto groups of people that it becomes morally wrong, I think. But but Whitman seemed to think that you first have to re-educate yourself about the body and you have to learn to love your feces. And so I sing the body electric as an attempt to reconstruct the attitude to the body so that disgust wouldn't spread outwards. Um, but we don't know whether people really could live like that. I, I, I think it's hard to imagine whether there could be, a, I, I would like to think that there can be societies that, you know, they may keep disgust at feces and other bodily fluids, because probably that's evolutionarily valuable in steering us away from things like spoiled milk and so on. Um, but, you know, but avoid projecting it onto people. I would like to think there could be such a society, but I don't know that there ever has been one. So I think you're right that, you know, we solve one problem and then it pops up in another place. But at least I think what we can do is refuse to base law on it. That we can do, and we, we really should resist uh, Devlin and Cass and say, well, law at any rate is only based on an, a million idea of harm. And, uh, and I think to a great extent we're moving in that direction. Now, I think you're right that the partisan bickering, uh, they find the disgust is a very potent weapon. I mean, you see this in Washington today. You can find hundreds of examples in the recent threats directed against members of Congress, but I've seen it, you know, unpopular figures who are being attacked uh, in all kinds of ways f turn up on websites with things smeared all over them and so on. Um, and. I, you know, it's powerful. It brings people together. I think you're right. And so we really have to resist that. But I don't know any reason to believe that if we were in a, you know, a fascist society, it would be any less. I mean, it's just a bond, human bonding thing that could happen in any kind of, of society. And I think what's important is to denounce it when it happens and just say we're not about that. And that is happening now, I'm very glad to say. So we hope that it will keep on happening. Thank you.